Good morning. Oh, Mr. McCormick, a special appearance. Wow. Um, we're doing this a little early today, so you all can uh, uh, watch the president's events or travel uh, as, it, as you may be needed to do. Um, before we take our regularly scheduled questions, we'll hear from Secretary Sebelius, uh, who will talk to you all about um, some demonstration projects and grants uh, and a program that the President, uh, as you know, during the recent joint session of Congress asked her to look into regarding medical malpractice. So uh, I will turn it over to the Secretary. Well, thank you. Good morning. Um, on Tuesday of this week, uh, we received the latest evidence that the health care system is simply unsustainable. The Kaiser Family Foundation came out with a new study showing that for families, health insurance premiums rose from under $6,000 to over $13,000 in the last 10 years. And a second report from the Business Roundtable focused on companies, which show that uh, they estimate companies will pay over $28,000 in health care costs for each employee in the next 10 years. Uh, so you heard from the President a week ago who outlined a plan to move in a new direction, providing security and stability to Americans who have coverage and affordable coverage to those who don't, and raise the quality for all Americans, slow the rising costs for families, businesses, and governments. But as part of that new direction, he directed me as Secretary of Health and Human Services to move forward on medical liability demonstration projects that put patient safety first and let doctors focus on practicing medicine. Now, this is an area we know we can do better. Uh, as many as 98,000 Americans die every year from medical errors. And though malpractice premiums themselves count for only a small percentage of total medical costs, many doctors report that they practice costly defensive medicine because they are fearful of lawsuits. So reflecting these concerns, the presidential memo memorandum that I received today directs my department to make $25 million in grants available to states, localities, and health systems to try out new patient safety and medical liability models. Grants are going to be available for the development, implementation, and evaluation of models that do four things. Put patient safety first and work to reduce preventable injuries. Foster better communication between doctors and their patients. Ensure that patients are compensated in a fair and timely manner for medical injuries while reducing the incidence of frivolous lawsuits. And finally, reduce liability premiums. Now, those goals are consistent with the principles identified by the Joint Commission and the Institute of Medicine and the goals that were contained in the legislation that President Obama, as a senator, introduced in 2005 with then-Senator Hillary Clinton. We're moving forward on the projects immediately, as the President requested. Within 30 days, We'll post an official funding opportunity announcement on grants.gov. Uh, after that, potential grantees will have 60 days to apply for two different kinds of grants. Um, One-year planning grants of up to $300,000 that will help states and localities and health systems develop and conceptualize new patient safety and medical liability models and demonstration grants for up to three years and three million dollars that will help implementation of projects that are ready to go. Uh, we, at the same time that the grant applications are being submitted, the Agency for Health Research and Quality will be conducting a review of what is currently in place throughout the United States and what evidence uh, there is that has been gathered about what works and doesn't work. As required by law, every application will go through a rigorous review process at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which includes, by law, a peer review by independent scientific experts. At the end of the process, we'll announce the grant awards early in 2010. 
So the demonstrations are about learning what works and what doesn't. Grantees will be required to report back to us with data on patient safety and medical liability costs. And as I mentioned earlier, this isn't a new area of interest for the President. He said from the start of the reform process that he's open to any idea that will help improve health care quality and patient safety and bring down overall costs. The demonstrations made possible by the grants will help us learn what changes are needed in our health care and medical liability system to help accomplish the goals. And we're looking forward to collecting the data, sharing it, and acting on part of our ongoing effort to assure that all Americans have access to the best quality, most affordable health care possible. Sure. Chuck. If this is such a serious problem as what it says in the release, then why just a demonstration project? Why isn't this part of the comprehensive health care? Well, I think the good news is that the President feels strongly enough about this that he wants us to move ahead right now. He's not using this as a lever. Uh, in the health care debate, but he feels that we can move ahead. We've had this authority within the Agency for Health Research and Quality since 1999. Uh, nobody, uh, not the prior administration, not anybody, has ever directed that this agency um, move ahead, and the President thinks we should do it right now. So we're going to move ahead the same way we moved ahead, we announced yesterday, we're moving ahead on a medical homes model, which is a great experiment. Uh, taking place in various parts of the country, lowering costs and delivering high quality care. But if the research is already there. The research is not there. But it seems that you have enough research to know this is a serious problem. Why, you know, why not work with Congress? It clearly could be beneficial to you guys politically. It's something Republicans want to be involved with. It just seems like, how does somebody not interpret this as saying, well, you know what? Trial lawyers are a huge interest group for the Democratic Party, so that's why they're going, go, they're going slowly. Let me I mean, see. I mean, I, I think you can recall from the presidential campaign, I don't recall us being the preferred candidate of the trial lawyers that you mentioned. Second, as the Secretary said, uh, uh, I'd <laughs> uh, check your FEC figures in the primary. Um, yeah, check out OpenSecrets.org. You got uh, happy to do it. Uh, right. I think a candidate that's done some interviews with you now. Um, the authority has existed since 1999. There are certainly provisions in some of the House bills uh, that uh, would codify some of the sorry works ideas that the President introduced in the Senate. But the thing here, Chuck, is we could wait and wait and wait, uh, or the President could, as he did, instruct the Secretary uh, to act in setting these projects and programs up in order to get them going and moving to ensure patient quality and get doctors practicing medicine again, rather than waiting for a uh, political football to get tossed around uh, the aisle. Madam Secretary, yes. how, how soon do you anticipate things actually changing in the real world based on the grants, the work done, and the changes as actual doctors and patients interact and the system begins to adapt? what these demonstration projects were being. Well, we're hoping that um, the incentives will encourage systems to come together and look at models that are already in place. We know at, you know, the, the kind of sorry works, the system in the, that was contemplated in the medic bill is already in place. The University of Michigan and um, children's hospitals throughout Kentucky that have demonstrated that they can um, reduce litigation costs, uh, compensate pa patients in a much more timely fashion, improve communication. So there are some models in place that we hope uh, we'll take a look at and could be put in place very quickly. Lots of states have, have bits and pieces of the puzzle. There are states with screening panels. There are states that have review processes. There are some voluntary uh, mediation efforts, and we think this is an opportunity to not only look at what has had a proven effect lowering uh, preventable errors, uh, increasing patient safety, which is the number one goal, improving communications, and, and lowering costs. So we'll share that data. We're going to inform people around the country. There's never been a uh, scientific look at what works and what doesn't. There's been a lot of anecdotal battles, really, for three decades. We think this is a big step forward. Madam yes, sir. The, the, some states have passed uh, malpractice reform, obviously. Um, have. Has HHS looked at what's happened in those states and seen if any of them meet uh, these four 
requirements? That's what we're going to do. That's the review that's going to be underway. It's never happened before. So no. when you say demonstration projects, you, you, you don't just mean, I guess I, I'm misunderstanding. There are two areas where states or medical systems can apply for grants. One is a planning grant that will be up to a year, up to $300,000 to uh, look at what may work in that jurisdiction or within that medical system and put something in place. The other is a demonstration project that uh, could run for up to three years. At the same time, the Agency for Health Research and Quality is going to be reviewing just exactly what is out there scientifically, what, what has some evidence that it's had an impact on patient safety, on lowering costs, and share that information as we go forward. Yes, sir. Uh, $25 million is a pretty small amount at first, and I'm wondering if you thought about how it would be expanded if, if these demonstration projects proved efficacious, and also how this interacts with um, the legislation uh, that's moving through Capitol Hill, the health care bill that builds, like the House one, that contains a similar program. Well, I think the, the good news is that this can move forward uh, within the next 60 days, and, and the grant applications can start coming in immediately. We'll have the framework up. So this is a faster process than um, legislation uh, can be, because that will take some time. Um, I, we haven't thought at this point about how to expand. We're hoping that this uh, becomes a, an opportunity for, as I say, medical systems in some jurisdictions have moved ahead. There are some states that have done work in this area, but others are um, strapped for cash, you know, don't have the resources at this point and don't really have a lot of incentive, and we hope this will jump start it. And we'll take a look at you know, if, if this is effective and, and works and if the evidence shows that it uh, helps with patient safety, lowers costs and reduces uh, costs and um, frivolous lawsuits, then I think there'll be an appetite, uh, certainly on Congress and elsewhere, to, to increase this. I'm sorry, but on the legislation, I mean, does this, does this counteract? Does this work with Oh, I don't think it counteracts them? anything. I think it captures some of the legislative intent and, you know, jump starts it. Um, but I think there's a lot of interest in, in Congress, uh, Republicans and Democrats, to figure out a way to get at what, at least anecdotally, doctors say is a high cost of defensive medicine. Uh, to lower the, we know that close to 100,000 people die from preventable errors every year. Patient safety is something that I think Republicans and Democrats take very seriously. Certainly the President does. Improve communications, compensating uh, victims who um, are injured at a more timely and, and uh, more um, adequate fashion, I think, are all part of the goals that we'll be looking at. Yes, question should, should, on demonstration projects? Yes. Um, well, you mentioned yourself that with, with legislation, everything will take much longer. This is something administratively you can done, do much more quickly. Um, but one area where the states are concerned and are trying to reach um, or changes in the legislation is Medicaid. And if you expand Medicaid, they feel that they cannot afford themselves to share the, the cost. So. What is the White House position? Because they do oppose um, expanding it unless the federal government pays for all of that expansion. Well, as a recently recovering governor, I certainly feel the pain of um, the states who are in really the worst fiscal crisis uh, probably since the Great Depression and are very sensitive to any unfunded mandates. I think what has happened is governors have had their voices heard. Um, the House uh, had uh, a significant cost share for expanded Medicaid at a 90-10 sharing. The Senate Help Committee doesn't have jurisdiction over Medicaid, but when the Finance Committee uh, came out with their proposal yesterday, again, it's a um, significant, it's close to the 90-10 mark. Um, but there are additional Medicaid savings, immediate uh, additional funding for uh, Medicaid drug rebate, uh, an enhanced uh, FMAP share for currently states who have picked up some of the childless adult population, which would be included. So on balance, we've actually put out a state-by-state -state analysis, and on balance, the vast majority of states, if the bills currently contemplated are passed, 
would actually come out as beneficiaries uh, from the proposal. So I think Congress has listened carefully to um, the states who say we're, we're eager to work with you on health reform, but what we can't do is absorb a huge share of new costs. Should so regulators the take a greater role in is investigating? Is practice on the part of the doctors? Or, or what is the, is malpractice the, the issue? Well, I think patient safety is the primary issue to uh, drive toward a system where we reduce um, the goal, the best goal would be to eliminate uh, preventable medical errors. Uh, so better protocol, uh, better safety, but certainly lowering costs of malpractice, lowering costs of defensive medicine, which um, causes potentially billions of dollars in redundant tests or unnecessary procedures, uh, getting to a point where if, a, if an error occurs, there's just and rapid compensation and, and we move forward. So I think there are multiple goals as outlined by the proposals, better communication, lowering medical errors, higher patient safety, uh, reducing lawsuits. Involved in this? OSHA, um, not to my knowledge. There's really not a. They don't really have a role in the in the malpractice uh, system right now. It's really a framework of state and federal laws, and then uh, what occurs, you know, in the um, it's the board. The certification of doctors often determines what the standard of practice is. So it's really not an OSHA situation. Yes. Should regulators take a greater role in investigating medical error and sanctioning doctors? Is that part of the solution and does the, does the pilot project look to that at all? Um, at this point, we are open to any demonstration projects, any um, planning grants that meet those four criteria. So we're not trying to prejudge what a state or um, health entity might come forward with. I, I think the regulatory role is often at the licensure end and, and um, sometimes a, a litigation then results in a complaint to the Board of Healing Arts or whoever has that oversight over licensure and can result in uh, a subsequent investigation, but whether that becomes part of this opportunity at the state or local level, I think remains to be seen. Is legislation <clears throat> still part of the mix, Robert or Madam Secretary, as health care reform goes forward, or do you see this move as something that takes the pressure off legislating on this issue in this particular bill now? I think that briefing, a senior administration official Plus. described it as a, a possible impediment to getting a deal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean what is that about? I, I want to point out Margaret sneezed a few minutes ago. <laughs> Very correctly in the sleeve. I mean, it would be one thing if it was. I don't know. Who's got some Purell? Give that to Mr. Todd right away. A little, little hand sanitizer. Good. Good. We'll have Elmo give Chuck a special briefing. We'll get Elmo over. Elmo knows how to sneeze. <laughs> We Just will seek to, uh, to try Sorry. to bring Chuck up to the level of a four, or five, I, or six year old. Uh, that's good. <laughs> yes, sir. Allow me for that digression. <laughs> uh, back to the legislation. Uh, does this. Is this something that helps it, or do you just want to keep this issue out of the legislation? Because others in the administration describe tort reform med mal as a potential impediment causing more problems than it solves in the legislative debate over health care. Well, I think that there's no question that. Uh, the issue of tort reform has been a very contentious issue at the state level for a couple of decades, at the federal level for at least that long. I, I don't think this is an either or. Um, I see this as very complementary to some of the proposals on the table and certainly um, has been an interest of Republicans and Democrats to figure out the situation. What we're able to do, because the authority has been within the Agency for Health Quality and Research is move ahead. Um, you know, the legislative debate will continue whether or not there are various proposals in the final legislation that comes to the President's desk, I can't predict. But what I can tell you is we can take this step now, and the President believes in this seriously enough that he directed me to do just that. He doesn't want to wait and see what may or may not happen. He introduced legislation in 2005. He co-authored a uh, New England Journal of 
Medicine article in 2006. This is something that isn't new to him. It isn't new in the health reform debate. He believes in it seriously, uh, and he thinks we should go ahead and, and move with the authority that we've had for a decade. Just, just to follow up, is it a dual track process then that, that doing this research and the administration is also push, pushing for legislation this fall? Well, they, as I say, I don't, I don't have a way of telling you exactly what components of this discussion will be in the final legislation. What's in the House versions right now are very complementary to some systems that are already in place to what uh, the President proposed in 2005. I think there are lots of creative ideas. I mean, states are the laboratories of innovation. There are lots of things going on at the state level within integrated health systems, within practices that I think have some real merit. What we need to do is apply some scientific rigor and see really what works. We, we know what the problems are, too many medical errors, high costs, particularly of some specialty areas of liability insurance, uh, often lots of injured victims not being compensated at all. So the challenges are there, and I, I think this is a real opportunity to get some creative thinking uh, and bring people together to figure out what works. Bill. So, Madam Secretary, who, who's the real target here? Is it lawyers who are filing frivolous lawsuits or doctors who are not practicing safe medicine? All of the above. I think, I think both. And can you kind of put it in perspective? We keep hearing about tort reform or malpractice, and, that, and the President focuses on the rapidly increasing cost of the medical system. So, like, what percentage would you say of the increase in premiums is due to malpractice? Is it 10 percent? Is it 50 percent? Is it Well, big? what we know, because it's a, it's a number that you can get your hands on, is about 1 percent of the overall cost of um, health care is attributable to malpractice premiums. That's a number that really hasn't changed very much um, over the years. What we don't know is how much defensive medicine could be eliminated with different kinds of systems. So doctors will tell you that um, they do order additional tests, uh, you know, look over their shoulder constantly for different procedures, fearing lawsuits. How much of that is not uh, called for, it, I have no way of estimating, but um, we also have a fee-for-service system that, that rewards by, you know, by contact and not quality. So I, but I think we've got too many medical errors, uh, too many people being injured or dying uh, every year. Uh, we have a system that often victims do not get compensated at all or it takes years to arrive at that. Any, you know, we've got a, a situation where there are uh, frivolous lawsuits being filed against uh, practicing physicians that discouraging some specialists from practicing in, in certain areas. So uh, there are some challenges out there that we think, and the President certainly feels, can be addressed by moving ahead. And to have the agency within the Department of Health and Human Services charged with quality of medical care and research, uh, moving ahead on this, I think, is, is an appropriate lens to look at what works. You know, some states have moved ahead 20 years ago. So there's a body of evidence. It really never has been examined or looked at, and that's part of what we're going to do. So we'll take one more. And then we'll uh, okay. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Madam Secretary, many doctors are saying that they might leave the practice, medical practice. What's wrong with them, and how can you keep them in practice, and uh, are you worried about them? Well, we certainly, um, I, I hear that um, also, and particularly, you know, that the, the Providers who are paying the highest rates are often in specialized areas, uh, OBGYNs and neurosurgeons, um, uh, areas where there are limited supply anyway, and there are lots of folks who just say, I'm not going to do this anymore. I mean, the cost of practice is just too great. So I think this is an effort to um, see if we can reduce costs, look at I think there are also, frankly, some insurance challenges where um, liability is broken down into very small categories and charged very, you know, we talk about the big pools should be available to Americans uh, to buy health insurance. Uh, it also should be available to medical providers. Right now, uh, we segment, we allow uh, those 
practices to be segmented and identified and often pay four, five, six times regardless of their individual experience. So I think there, there's an opportunity to look at a whole series of reforms uh, and let the states and local health systems figure out what works and inform uh, Congress and the President about how we best deal with this situation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you Sir? Sir? I am. Thanks. A few questions on missile defense, Robert. Mm -hmm. Under this new architecture that the President described, <coughs> is there going to be any presence in the Czech Republic and Poland, or is now is that now just completely gone? No, no, no. Let me, uh, I, let me, I would point you to uh, General Cartwright, who I think in the Department of Defense, that they, they briefed, as you saw, right after Secretary Gates, uh, which can give you some more technical uh, dealings on this uh, and a notion of the operational capabilities uh, and where some of that's being looked at. I, I think the the biggest thing to step back and understand is that this is uh, this is an improved ballistic missile defense system uh, based on better technology, um, based on uh, the latest intelligence assessments about threats posed particularly by Iran, uh, that enhances our homeland security, um, protects our troops based overseas, and provides for the defense of our uh, European allies. Uh, I think um, if you look at what Secretary Gates particularly and what General Cartwright, General Cartwright who has been tasked uh, in both this administration and the previous administration at the Pentagon in working technically with deployment of sensors and interceptors and what have you. These are the two individuals that in 06, in the beginning of 07, made a recommendation uh, based on, again, the most current technology and the most current intelligence assessment. Based on changes in technology and in those assessments, uh, that team recommended and the President accepted a decision uh, for an improved missile defense system that we think uh, does a better job. It's still, a, understanding that rationale, <coughs> it's still a pretty basic point to say where are these land-based yeah. interceptors going to be. And I would point you to uh, the Department of Defense to answer that. What about this other issue of Russia's well-known opposition to the old plan? Can you clarify whether there was any quid pro quo? Did Russia get anything out Absolutely. of the deal? No, this is, this is not about Russia. This is about protecting our homeland. It's about protecting uh, the troops that we have deployed overseas that protect our freedom. Uh, and it was about ensuring the defense uh, of our allies, uh, our European and NATO allies. Uh, that's why this decision was made. The review that the President talked about uh, was to ensure effective, both technologically and cost effective. We did not want to deploy something that didn't work. I think we've gotten uh, the best of all worlds in this because we have a system that works better and protects us uh, on a timeline that's quicker than we had before. So Russia's view on the old system was not a factor in no, any way? I, I think, I think you, you saw the President directly address and make mention today of what he had said throughout the campaign, which was that Iran did pose uh, did have a ballistic missile threat that clearly, based on additional and more recent assessments, we believe that assessment intelligence-wise has changed from an intercontinental ballistic missile capability uh, that's less advanced compared to a medium and intermediate range ballistic missile capability now. Uh, and I think you heard him say in the statement that uh, Russian concerns about this were unfounded then uh, and would be today. Robert, can you? Um, Eastern European allies are, allies are clearly, clearly not happy about this development, the pulling back from the previous administration's missile defense uh, plan. Uh, how do you uh, show them the U.S. commitment to their defense? And what do you say to critics also who uh, would, would, would think that this sends a message of weakened U.S. resolve to Iran at a time when the U.S. is trying to put pressure well, on let's them? Let's address the second one first. I, I think, in all honesty, I think they're 
based on some early and inaccurate and erroneous reporting on what was what the president had decided and ultimately announced uh, might have caused some uh, to react in a way uh, that isn't based on what the president, Secretary Gates, General Cartwright, and others have come to the conclusion of. Um, this shows, well, let me, first and foremost, this does not absolve Iran from the responsibilities to the international community that it has to and must uphold, first and foremost. Secondly, again, this is based on the most up-to-date intelligence assessments about what their greatest capabilities are, uh, where they have been making advancements uh, in directly addressing the potential threat uh, from that country. So the notion that somehow uh, we're doing anything other than improving on a plan, uh, I think, is an unfounded criticism. Again, I don't, I don't doubt that part of that is because, uh, uh, and I started getting emails, uh, uh, others at 1 in the morning, uh, uh, pretty early in the morning, uh, about, uh, I think, a report that just simply uh, was inaccurate. Uh, the first part of your question, again, I, I think uh, uh, we have uh, talked with our allies, uh, the Czech Republic, uh, Poland, uh, all of Europe and NATO, obviously. Uh, we have extremely strong relationships that uh, we think are strengthened and will continue. Uh, we have the President, and we'll have some readouts on these calls uh, in a little bit, have talked to the leaders. Uh, teams were dispatched uh, to go meet with our allies. And I think, in all honesty, once uh, they understand uh, what is in this decision, decision, uh, they also will feel uh, like we've come to uh, a better decision uh, based on improved uh, technology uh, that protects them, too. Robert, can you talk about the, the threat from Iran? Uh, Vice President Biden said in an interview with our Pentagon correspondent Chris Lawrence that I'm much less concerned about Iranian potential. They have no potential at this point to launch a missile that can strike the United States of America. In light of the new information, the intelligence you say about long-range missiles as opposed to short and moderate-range missiles, what is the threat from Iran? What, what are we conveying to the American people about the threat level that is coming from the regime? Well, look, I don't think anybody has sugarcoated the notion that, uh, that we believe that uh, their illicit nuclear program uh, poses uh, great security concerns for us and for many of our, uh, many in the international community. Um, I think what uh, Vice President Biden uh, was talking about was exactly the renewed and updated intelligence assessment that led the very same people in 2006 to recommend uh, one architecture and configuration uh, to, based on that updated intelligence, uh, recommend to the president something different in 2009. Again, partly based on capability and technology. Obviously, uh, what, what, what worked in 2006 uh, has been improved on for several years, uh, and here we are in 2009. And as I said, it is our belief that uh, the more significant threat posed right now is that of medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles. One important capability function of this new architecture is it lets us adapt as the intelligence changes, so that you are not having to deploy a second or a third configuration. Uh, this is an adaptable configuration uh, that will allow us to address uh, any changing nature of threats in the region. So what should be the takeaway when, when people hear about this new intelligence and they say, okay, it's not long-range missiles, it's short-term, moderate-range missiles that Iran is capable of, of launching? Well, I don't, I, I don't want to get into operational capability. I'm, I'm simply denoting that the intelligence uh, assessment of the likeliest uh, threat that needed to be addressed by an architecture of ballistic missile defense is being met in this decision.
based on the most up-to-date intelligence assessments of the possibility. Right, but the president's going to go before the UN Security Council and say, you know, tougher economic sanctions if, if Iran doesn't comply regarding its nuclear program. So what, what do the American people take away from this? Is Iran less threatening, less dangerous with this new intelligence, or more so? Well, I think the important thing for the American people and the international community to know is that we take any possible threat with the utmost seriousness, that the President spends a good portion of his day thinking about and ensuring the safety of our homeland, of the military that we have deployed around the world, uh, and our allies, uh, that this decision represents uh, what he and the team, his national security team, believe best addresses uh, those capabilities. We take very seriously, as the international community does, um, the threat posed by Iran's illicit nuclear weapons program. This is something that will be discussed, as you mentioned, next week, both at the UN General Assembly, uh, at when leaders convene uh, as well at the G20 in Pittsburgh, and ultimately in uh, the P5 plus one talks uh, that are scheduled to happen at the beginning of October. Uh, we think Iran has some decisions to make about the pathway uh, that they want uh, to take and what they want to demonstrate to the international community about the responsibilities they're willing to uphold. Yes, uh, do you think the, uh, the White House and the President consulted with Congress and allies sufficiently on this decision? Uh, I do, and I think there additional briefings will happen on Capitol Hill today. What allies got a heads up on this uh, besides Poland uh, and uh, the Czech Republic uh, ahead of time? To my knowledge, that's the only calls that uh, that have been made. The Russia, Czech, the Czech Prime Minister, not that I know. Of. Israel. Uh, I, I, I will check, and we'll read out whatever calls uh, the president has made. The Czech Prime Minister said that he got a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we're doing a, a geography thing, so let's let me find out, and uh, we can. Uh, the Czech I'm sorry. Prime Minister said he got a phone call from the president after midnight last night. Senator John McCain is the ranking Republican on Armed Services says he doesn't know anything about this uh, decision and he's just finding out about it through media reports. How is that adequate consultation? Uh, I will check with the legislative and national security team to see uh, the degree to which uh, the decision was conveyed to members of Capitol Hill. Do you think that, I mean, just, it, could you understand why somebody uh, might think this was a hastily made announcement? Uh, that, that no, I, I can't because uh, it was a decision made several days ago by the president after a many months review uh, of our uh, of missile defense architecture uh, uh, to address uh, a threat we've known about for quite some time. This is, we've talked in here uh, about the notion that we were assessing uh, the way forward. This is to a lot of Americans, apparently including the ranking Republican on the Senate Armed Services Committee, this is the first time they've heard about this technology. You don't think that there would have been a... <coughs> the first time they've heard what technology? This new uh, missile defense system, this new more mobile, I think it's, I don't think that's, I, I don't think that's, I don't think that's accurate because I think a lot of, uh, uh, some of what we're talking about is, uh, uh, is deployed in and around, uh, uh, in and around the world to address other threats. The idea, I'm talking about the idea that there's this other option of a more mobile system of, um, uh, that can be land, increasingly land and sea based. Uh, as an alternative. I don't think it's new technology uh, for the most part, but uh, let me check and, and we'll check with General Cartwright. Again, I think what's important to understand, I keep going back to this. A lot of us have been covering this since, since the election, since President Obama won, and the signals started being sent from Russia and you guys started communicating. We went with you guys to Russia. And this idea that there's this alternative idea that would possibly be less offensive to the Russians, though I understand you're saying that's not why you're doing it, right. uh, is new. It's brand new. Well, I think there's, uh, I think there are a number of different uh, ways that you look at addressing whatever uh, the intelligence assesses is your uh, most important threat. Uh, obviously, we've talked about in here, the president um, wanted to ensure that whatever was deployed was both technologically effective and cost effective. And I think one of the benefits of this uh, is it improves on both of those things. We think there's a greater capability based on uh, technology that has been improved upon uh, uh, 
and that we know uh, has been tested and works. But so just to put a, a period on this, so you believe that the administration has, <laughs> has just, that it'll be well, a yes or no. I didn't ellipse the end of mine, but go ahead. <laughs> just, you believe that the administration and the president gave enough of a heads up to well, <coughs> Congress? I want to check with allies and enough preparation to the American people that this decision might be made, that yeah. this, this... I, I get we've, uh, I assume that, uh, I don't know how much the American people watch uh, our briefings, uh, but it's been a question posed in here before about when the decision would come based on the president's uh, review of our ballistic missile architecture. No, no, so I'm not talking about the debate itself about missile defense. I'm talking about this no, no, new path. No, no, no. We've we've talked about we've talked about the review in here. So uh, I, I will certainly check with legislative affairs in terms of uh, certain congressional notifications. But uh, I don't think it's been a surprise to anybody, based on the fact that we've discussed it in here, uh, that the review was ongoing. But you haven't discussed the specific plan that came out today. I mean, this is what there weren't any. I, mean, <laughs> I know it seems weird that uh, that a group of people could go into a situation room, uh, uh, discuss a subject, make a decision, and then we'd, we'd simply announce it uh, without three or four or five weeks of, uh, of stories coming out about where we were stories. going. I'm talking about people on Capitol Hill knowing that this is something that might be coming up, people like John McCain. Again, yeah. I'll check with legislative affairs on that. Okay. Um, how involved was the White House in this many months process? What was the White House role in that process? Was there an ongoing dialogue absolutely. back and forth? With uh, absolutely. With, uh, with, I mean, obviously this involves the State Department, involves the Pentagon, it involves uh, the White House, and was based on uh, a pledge that the President made uh, during the campaign to evaluate our, our posture and our architecture. The way this is being described is that this was a unanimous decision coming from the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. Did the White House in any way make clear to the Pentagon that they would like to move away from the Poland and Czech Republic? No, again, this is, this is a, the people that made a recommendation to then President Bush in 2006, Secretary Gates, General Cartwright, uh, are the same people involved in making a recommendation uh, in 2009 to this president. But can you categorically deny that they were under any pressure Absolutely. from the White House to do so? I think the notion that, uh, that somehow we would put pressure on uh, and come up with something that didn't work as well, uh, first of all, uh, I think that is uh, notionally crazy. Uh, and I would, uh, of course, categorically deny uh, that uh, what we're doing is anything but in the best interest of keeping this country, keeping the members of our armed forces, uh, and keeping our allies safe. One more. Um, what was the uh, was secu the security of Israel a factor in moving to the new system? Uh, let me check with NSC on that. I, I want to go to the Iran assessment here that Vice President Biden made. Isn't this a big deal if, if the intelligence community is now assessing the Iranian threat as much less than what we've been told? No, 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 no. Well, that's what came out of I, this. I'm hesitant to do this uh, here. Uh, uh, I think the assessment that has led to the ultimate decision that we've made, and I would point you to what Secretary Gates and what General Cartwright have said today, what led us to this is uh, the degree to which we think the capability is, is which, which is more advanced at what point. Uh, the conclusion of the intelligence assessments is that medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles uh, are uh, something that pose a greater threat uh, at this point than intercontinental. Now, I guess going to that point, why, why would you only prepare to have something that meets the, the, the immediate threat that you feel like is there now. I mean, why wouldn't you want to have the maximum amount of protection? Well, again, now? that's what I, I mean, talked to Susanna. You talked about flexibility to do this if you need to. Why not do the if you need to now? It couldn't no, no, it be no, 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 no. That, that's, that, that's, that's what this system and capability allows you to do. You it allows you to. I understand that, but why isn't that, then why no, isn't no, no, that no. the announcement? Hey, we're, we're going to protect the, 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 we're going to. I think the name Maximize of the, the, use what's of the, the name of the system. the first word in the announcement is adaptive. I, I don't right. 
phased adaptive approach, right? I, I'm sorry, it's the second word. I can see how that would flummox you. Which in the, and of itself um, doesn't did, did say, have a sense of adaptive. The ability to adapt to a changing circumstance based on an intelligence assessment that denoted a change in architecture in order to address that assessment. I guess what I'm going to say is why, why just wait for the I mean, isn't there an argument to be made, which some have made in, in pushing for this missile defense system in the past? Don't, don't just be adaptive. Be fully prepared now to Chuck, protect against long range. Chuck, we are deploying a system that addresses the threat to our homeland, to our troops, and to our allies. That threat is being addressed by this system, okay? Again, I think part of the confusion of this is if you read early reports of this, one would believe that the entire system was being scrapped, right? Trust me, it complicated my life this morning uh, in a way that I wish it hadn't. I can only imagine it complicated yours as well. Uh, the front page of the Wall Street Journal, um, just to be clear. Um, Yes. Single out somebody. <laughs> well, I asked my father. No, 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 no. It's not. It's Jonathan didn't write the story, uh, but I th the the program that is announced addresses uh, addresses the threat. Uh, the emphasis is on what we believe is uh, the greatest threat right now. That this the, the the benefit of this is it allows us to continue that configuration and adapt to any changing intelligence assessment. So do you completely eliminate this premise that somehow this does improve, this takes off a, uh, a pointed issue that, we, that the United States had with the Russians? Do you just dismiss well, the premise that it doesn't help there? The decision, I'm not an international relations theorist. The decision- It's helpful, is that a good thing? Well, I, I, I think first concerned. and foremost, the decision that was made was based on what we faced and what technology we had to address what we faced. How do we protect this country, first and foremost? How do we protect those that are deployed to protect our country? And how do we protect our allies? That's the lens, the only lens through which this decision was made. That's it. Couldn't somebody make the case that improved relations with Russia helps deal with the Iranian issue and then that well then uh, that I think the Iranian I think helps the, in your negotiations with Iran and therefore is part of this decision I think the Russians are going to get a chance to decide how constructive they want to be on Iran uh, in the next few weeks and this uh, takes an issue off the table but the decision that was made was made purely and simply on what works on what addresses the threat on what protects our homeland and what protects uh, those that are deployed to protect our homeland. Really quickly on health care, mm -hmm. there's a group of House Republicans, a Republican study commi committee, sent a letter asking for a meeting with the White House, three or four Republicans. You guys have, the President has said he is open to meet with other folks. Is he going to accept that meeting? Uh, I'll take a look at that letter. I know, as you know, uh, Senator uh, Bennett from Utah was here yesterday to talk to the President about health care, and uh, I assume there'll be uh, other Republicans as this debate continues. John. On well, next week, um, the president kind of raised the bar pretty high for September in L'Aquila. He said that on Iran, uh, that the diplomatic door would be closing by, by this month um, if there weren't constructive uh, signs out of Tehran. On trade, uh, he said, said that there would be um, tangible signs toward reopening the Doha round next year that we would possibly see in, in Pittsburgh. Uh, and on um, climate change. We were supposed to get a, a package of, of climate change finance. Um, he's coming in now. Uh, the Chinese and the Russians are saying they're not going to go along with sanctions against the energy industry in, in Iran. Um, sorry, who's? The Chinese and the Russians. Well, again, I, to address that, I think, uh, I think the, <coughs> particularly the, the Russians are going to get a chance to decide how constructive they want to be. Okay. And, the, and on, on trade, the last thing we've had are the tire tariffs. And on climate, you know, the, the bill has been, the climate bill has been punted to next, next month, I mean, I mean, next year. I'm wondering if the president, if you feel like the president is walking into the UN General Assembly net meeting next week and, and to Pittsburgh in a weakened state, how can he grab back uh, the moral high ground on 
on trade, on on climate, um, and on Iran uh, in this in this climate. Well, I I think in some ways you won't find it surprising that I dispute your assessment of uh, of where we sit. And I think we talked about this just yesterday, Jonathan. The climate change is not simply something that. Uh, is for us to decide alone. Uh, we are going to have to take steps domestically, certainly, uh, and the House has taken a step to pass legislation to address it, uh, and the President will continue to work with the Senate to make sure that happens as well. Uh, but this is something that's going to have to happen in conjunction with developed and developing nations and economies throughout the world. This is, you know, I don't, I don't think the President thought we were going to come to Pittsburgh uh, with everything wrapped up. Uh, on the issue of climate change, uh, on the issue of, of Chinese tires, uh, in order to have a system of free and fair trade in this country, you're going to have to have a set of rules. Uh, we simply enforced a set of rules that had been agreed to uh, in advance. Uh, I, I don't think that loses the high ground uh, on ensuring that uh, our goods and services uh, are bought and sold overseas. Uh, as uh, as we import some goods and services uh, as well. Uh, and I think this is, there's no question this is an important several weeks for, uh, for Iran. I think we, um, uh, I think, as you know, the President will chair um, a U.N. Security Council meeting on proliferation. Uh, there will be assessments made at UN and at G20 um, about the Iranian uh, uh, willingness uh, to live up to their international obligations. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, a meeting on October the 1st where uh, our full intention and that of the P5 plus one is to address, uh, to address Iran directly uh, on, that, uh, on that illicit nuclear program. So I, I, I hesitate to, it's early, I hesitate to call the end of, uh, of all this. Have you said which day the President is delivering his address to the U.N. General Assembly? Uh, I think it's Wednesday. It's the 23rd, I think, I'm not sure. John. President speaking. Some of us are going to speaking okay. right now. So. If you guys want to, I'll take a few more questions Thanks. if you guys want to. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Rob. Uh, the President's going to honor his first Medal of Honor recipient this afternoon. Yeah. Um, he's going to meet with the family. Uh, what else does he do? maybe behind the scenes to uh, honor uh, those who are killed in Iraq and Afghanistan? Does he make phone calls? Does he send letters? What else does he do? I've heard the President, I think he's talked about this in public before, I think the hardest thing, the hardest job he has is, is signing the letters to those uh, loved ones and family members whose uh, sons or daughters or husbands or wives have been killed in defense of uh, our freedom uh, and of our country. Uh, I think it is uh, probably the hardest part of what he does, and I think as he makes decisions uh, about, about our defense, uh, he keeps uh, those thoughts and those family members in mind. Is there any, anything tangible that he does, though? Uh, the, uh, I don't those letters uh, that go to uh, to family members that he signs, uh, uh, I think he would tell you, unfortunately, all too often. Maybe. I have two questions. Okay, yes, ma'am. Exactly what is Iran's threat to our country? It's never threatened any of countries since the 16th century. I mean, what is uh, exactly, and also, is well, the president, I, I, I think if you look president at very happy that there's no government plan in Balkan's plan? Right. He didn't fight for it. Well. Let's take those two somewhat separate subjects. Um, uh, I think I could refer you to uh, any number of uh, threats. Come on. Well, I, I can refer you to any number of threats uh, that uh, leaders in Iran have made uh, against stalwart allies of ours, including uh, Israel. Even uh, then, they haven't said they'd attack them. They don't like them. Well, They're Helen, we would take we take the threat of, of one international leader telling a country that they should be wiped off the map of uh, and the face of this earth uh, quite seriously, particularly when 
uh, particularly when inspectors are removed from their country uh, there in no order to in, Israel, uh, in order to assess uh, or India or illicit Pakistan. nuclear weapons program. Why so you uh, them to I think let me answer just one of your now okay. burgeoning number of questions uh, uh, on this uh, Thursday. Um, Tell you that the buildup for the invasion of Iraq is it was in the same way. If we're going to, you know, go yeah. after Iran. You know, uh, going after Iran. Uh, I mean, what is the threat from Iran? Well, I, I, we've talked a little bit about that threat here today, uh, and uh, I think the threats that they have made uh, capture the attention of the world. Uh, I, I think there's there's absolutely uh, no doubt about that. And again. The Iranians are going to have decisions to make this month uh, and the beginning of next month uh, about the degree to which they're going to live up to their international responsibilities. The other countries. Which ones? What? Iran, uh, uh, Pakistan, India, Israel. Uh, I, I would have to check with the NSC on IAEA stuff on that. In terms of the public option, uh, Helen, I think the president was exceedingly clear last Wednesday in speaking to. Um, in speaking to Congress and the American people. He prefers and believes that choice and competition through a public option uh, is the best way to go. Uh, at the same time, if others have ideas that inject choice and competition in a private insurance, uh, an individual and small group market, uh, he's willing to listen to those. Uh, I think there'll be a debate. willing to listen to those who are for the public option. That's not true, Helen. You should they have no place at the table. Helen, they, 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 there's a pretty clear passage in the speech. I'm not sure who was at the table uh, when it got added, but I, I, it's a it's fairly declarative and clear, Major. Robert, on uh, uh, on the intelligence that has been formulated about the Iranian threat, will you be sharing that as specifically as possible with Congress? Uh, let me check with. I don't want to get way out on a limb on uh, on NSC stuff on this. In general, you'd have no objection with sharing well, I, that. I think some of this is based on uh, NIE assessments, some of which uh, I believe are uh, be classified regularly uh, regularly shared with. Uh, well, the reason I ask is on, on February second. I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but Iran launched a satellite that had uh, long-range ballistic missile technology equivalents as a part of that launch. On May 20th, it test fired a 1,200-mile solid fuel two-stage rocket. Some analysts have said those two tests, which have been established and verified, are consistent with a potential long-range nuclear missile threat, potentially. And I'm just wondering if, if those things or anything, or those facts are inconsistent with or can somehow be put in a different context by the intelligence that you have that says the real and more immediate threat is short range and medium range no, ballistic think, missiles. Uh, and I think, in fact, uh, again, we've th what I've discussed is medium and intermediate range rather than intercontinental. I think uh, some of what you just talked about in a 1,200 mile rocket falls in more of an immediate or intermediate range uh, ballistic missile capability. Uh, and look, there's there's no doubt that. Uh, without getting, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds either. Obviously, there is uh, um, uh, something that is 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 solid. A solid rocket uh, is is a, obviously a different capability uh, than something that is less mobile and liquid. So, uh, I think the system that is being deployed uh, through this announcement allows us to address. Uh, a number of those threats ongoing. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but obviously you object to the idea of shelving the system in the, in the headline of the Wall Street Journal. Are you, are you trying to let us know or convey to the American public that this is, in fact, a tougher or more robust or more aggressive I think it is, system I think it is, what was on the, on the I think it is more approved. I think we know the technology works. Uh, it's been tested. Uh, I think it covers uh, a greater share of the area. I think it... Uh, uh, it's based on the, the most up-to-date technology uh, and our threat. Uh, I think uh, that's been the focus of what uh, the President's review was about, uh, and I think the decision led from that review. I think uh, we will do this on a timeline uh, that allows this system uh, uh, to be in place and address uh, that threat uh, very quickly. Is Russia the threat or Iran? Uh, 
the threat of intermediate and medium range ballistic missiles uh, comes from Iran. Um, the, uh, the idea of protecting against short and mid range missiles would seem to indicate that you'd want to move uh, the defense systems closer physically to Iran. Um, first of all, is that a correct assumption? You know, I, I, I am technologically out of my depth to talk about uh, the, 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 the geographic deployment of capabilities. Uh, General Cartwright has uh, uh, four stars on his shoulder and uh, is, uh, is the person tasked in the Pentagon with that technological assessment, and I would point you to DOD. Okay, I think we can make us operate on that assumption. Maybe it's wrong. The Cartwright thing or just no, the, the <laughs> assumption the assumption that you'd have to physically locate defense systems closer to Iran to protect against short and mid-range. That seems to jive with Secretary Clinton's statement a month or two ago or whatever about creating a nuclear umbrella against Iran, which which some viewed as a concession that they're going to, to obtain nuclear weapons. Is that in any way a plausible uh, line of reasoning to follow? The, the no, I, I obviously the 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 posture that we're going to take in the next few weeks uh, in directly engaging uh, the Iranians through the P5 plus one process uh, in addressing their illicit nuclear weapons program by no means, uh, and quite contrary, uh, does not uh, assume, uh, uh, does not assume on any part what Iran might, may or may not have. Christian. Robert, will the president meet bilaterally with the Russians or, and or the Chinese? I don't know week? that the final schedule has been set yet. Uh, I think that those are two of the meetings that had previously been talked about, but I, I, I don't, I hesitate to get ahead of scheduling on that. So do you expect that there will be either officially as part of UN proceedings or informally some kind of progress or decision announced on sanctions on Iran? Uh, I believe the process of evaluating where we are uh, as the president talked about with other world leaders and taking stock, uh, I think that process, uh, I know he's had, he's begun, uh, continued to have discussions with leaders about that. And I think that process uh, will be, uh, will be ongoing. Yeah. Accepting that there was no quid pro quo, the action that's taken for whatever reason does involve, you know, removing a card from U.S.-Russia relations that could be played. Given that, do you expect any change in Russian behavior or attitudes on various big issues? And is there any concern that the decision will be portrayed by some Russian leaders as not necessarily a victory for uh, dialogue and negotiation, but uh, vindication of a strong nationalistic foreign policy? Uh, again, uh, I, I can't tell how other people interpret other things. I can simply tell you that the president and the team that made an original recommendation in 2006 and a different recommendation in 2009 based on assessments and based on technology uh, did, so, uh, uh, did so based on that and that alone. Uh, I, I can't uh, think through or surmise uh, other things. Um, can you, uh, Robert, can you update us on relocation plans on Guantanamo Bay detainees? Um, is Fort Leavenworth out of the running as to, uh, as Kansas senators suggested yesterday? Um, and what is the White House reaction to the defense appropriations language um, that would essentially prevent the president from shutting down Guantanamo Bay by not uh, appropriating any money to do so and to, you know, build or upgrade a facility? Let, let me do them. this. Let me get some guidance on that, and we'll be back to you in, in just a little bit on, uh, on both those questions. April. Robert, thanks for staying. Um, now on the question, um, I'm going to go back to... Um, I just had to get you a little dig in there, didn't you? <laughs> no, it wasn't a dig. It wasn't a dig. It was actually thank. I'm thanking you for I'm saying. Sincere. I'm sincere. I'm leaving. Sincere. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, people sincere. can't be real in this place. You know. <laughs> 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 oh, no, another subject. Um, the Jimmy Carter issue, Joe Wilson issue. How does this White House come up with the formula to discount the fact that race was involved in this at all? Well, uh, I, I was asked yesterday if, 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 we, if we agreed with President Carter's assessment, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, that a majority of, or a, a great, I, I don't know what the exact quote was, but uh, that this was based on uh, race. Uh, uh, the, the assessment is based on discussing with people here and with the President uh, uh, 
and sharing with you that uh, the belief is not that this is based on the color of one's skin, but on honest political disagreements that have uh, been going on for, uh, well, since the beginning of our country. I think, uh, I think some people quoted what Secretary Powell said uh, to some people yesterday, and I think it's something the President agrees with, is that we can have this type of disagreement, but we can do this in a way that's civil in tone uh, and in action. Uh, I think that is, uh, that is what uh, we've seen uh, as a hallmark of uh, even passionate political debates in this country uh, for quite some time. That there might be an odd scenario now. Um, just in recent weeks, you had former First Lady Laura Bush come out on television on CNN recently talking about the fact that people need to be respectful of this president. And um, do you see that there's an uptick since this president has come into office of the disrespect on certain issues? I mean, they're not race, but on certain issues. Well, look, I think. Um, I think the way that a lot of political discourse gets covered in this country is covered at the edges. It's covered by the loudest and shrillest uh, on either end of the political spectrum. Uh, that's what tends to uh, get covered um, on both sides. I think what the President believes is we can have these type of very passionate debates, but do so in a way uh, that is civil and respectful of all of those that are participating in these debates, acknowledging a difference in opinion, even if that's not the opinion with which you come to that debate with. Uh, I hope that's the way that we can deal with these problems because the President and I think many people involved in seeking solutions for our country believe that we have a series of very big challenges some of which have festered for a very long time that have to be addressed. And that if all of our time and our energy is taken up in the exercise of uh, yelling at each other, there's very little time left over for uh, coming to uh, a sensible agreement on how to move forward in addressing those problems. What do you say to people who are saying that the reason why you're discounting it is because this administration does not want to amplify race but because it would cause a whole host of other issues down the road? I, I, I rejected that yesterday. I rejected that Sunday. I would, I, my opinion on that hasn't changed either. I, I don't, you and I have talked about this. I just don't think that's true. Robert, well, yes, sir. Robert, the phone calls that the President has made uh, in response to the, to the missile shield, uh, the late night phone calls and all that. Well, let me just, what, what's let, been the can role I point out this? That what's late night in the Czech Republic tends not to be late night here since um, I think it's about 6 o'clock there now and it's, uh, it's uh, lunchtime here. So when, you, when we're talking about midnight phone calls in the Czech Republic, understand that uh, there is uh, uh, best I can last determine a time difference. Yes, I'm aware of that, but but thank you for the reminder. But the question is, what has been the if role? If you had to call your friend in the Czech Republic, I'd do so. You know, what has been what has been the role of Secretary Clinton in the middle of this process? Has she been making phone calls? Is she, what what's she been up to? Uh, I believe she has made phone calls on this. Uh, <clears throat> I will get again. I'll try to get a larger readout uh, on exactly. Uh, the the scope and the nature of each one of these phone calls. As a follow up, if if mm -hmm. Senator yeah, McCain, as a follow up, if Senator McCain was not informed about this, he said this morning that 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 this decision, I think he said, quote, was seriously misguided. You laid out your case for this. What do you know that Senator McCain apparently does not? Give well, the quote that he that he. Uh, I would. I, I guess I would ask uh, uh, Senator McCain when Secretary Gates and others go to brief the Hill today. Uh, to ask Secretary Gates and General Cartwright um, uh, what leads them to believe uh, the recommendation that they asked the President to make and that the President signed off on. Uh, I, I don't think that, uh, uh, I don't think that the, the, the two people that were uh, tasked with coming up with a recommendation for a previous President uh, would, would not be giving this President uh, their clear crystal clear and unvarnished opinion. I've been in meetings with both. Uh, I have not noticed a penchant for um, uh, sugar coating. Uh, I, 
think they're very clear and very direct, and I think they will be today. Susan, so, uh, do you have one more? Yeah, I have to ask, and uh, our plan team is learning that General Crystal made a decision in terms of the resources, the U.S. troops that would be necessary <laughs> in Afghanistan, but that he hasn't communicated that to the White House. <coughs> do you know if for any reason that he's been asked not to yet give that information to the White House? No, I, 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 I don't think that, best of my knowledge, that's not been also communicated to uh, to the Pentagon, uh, and this would go up through the, the normal chain of command. I'd reiterate exactly what I said yesterday and what, quite frankly, the President said far more eloquently than I. Um, we are going to take a broad assessment and review uh, of where our policy stands uh, in Afghanistan, uh, and that we are going to assess and get that strategy right and use that strategy to make those resource decisions. We have all seen, both in the somewhat short term and in the longer term, what happens when one makes resource decisions and then looks for a strategy. Uh, I, I think there's some, we've seen that movie before. The President's determined not to uh, repeat that movie again. Thanks, guys.